Hi, I'm Max. I'm on ACLU Rights for All Voters. Yes. As you know, our immigration system locks up hundreds of thousands of immigrants at a huge taxpayer cost every year, including mothers and children escaping violence. If elected president, will you commit to decreasing detention by 75% or more by the end of your first term? So you're talking to the guy that's the loudest voice in the Senate for decreasing detention everywhere. Not just for undocumented immigrants, but also people who are American citizens. Because we relieve the planet Earth in incarceration. We're 4% of the world's population, but we have one out of every four incarcerated people on the planet Earth are here in America. And I've visited a lot of these detention facilities for undocumented immigrants are private prisons, and I stand solidly against private, private prisons in America. We should understand what she's talking about because she's not just talking about the moral vandalism of separating families at our border. We're having people coming here to present themselves for legal asylum and either being turned away or putting into detention facilities that do not reflect their dignity and often compound their trauma. She's also talking about what's happening all over in this country where we see people who are, who are grandparents of American grandchildren, who are spouses of American citizens, and they are being separated from their families and put into detention and deported. We've had situations like that in, in New Jersey that rose our entire state's consciousness by saying, how could you do that? Taking somebody and deporting them for a traffic violation a decade or two ago and separating them from their families. I was in Nevada with a group of immigration activists and a teenage girl talked about her and her friends that if one of them was assaulted and they were afraid to go to the authorities to report the assault because their parents were undocumented and they knew if they reported the assault, the parents would have to show up and they might have their parents deported. Think about what we're creating. We're creating a situation that in my city of Newark, the immigrant community that used to cooperate with our local police to talk about crimes or robberies, now they're afraid to go to the local police because they're fear of getting deported. When you compromise your values in the name of security, you will lose them both, security and your values. We can have, and we will have if I am your president, an immigration system that reflects our values, that elevates the dignity of all humanity, that keeps us safe and secure by having real pathways to citizenship for the people that are in our country, that deals with our DACA kids as they are, which are American citizens in every way except for a piece of paper, that honors people here who want temporary protective status, not sending them back into the crisis zone. We can have an immigration system that achieves our values. How do I know that? It's because for generations in this country, we've been a nation of immigrants. That's what's made us strong in the past. It's what's going to make us strong in the future. Sir. My name is Bill Stump. This is my son, Kyle Stump. All right. It's nice to meet the Stumps when I'm on the stump. I'm sorry. The last, the last dad joke. Maybe my last dad joke, but nice to meet you, Mr. Mr. Stump. Kyle lets me speak for him. He's not real verbal, but he's a hard worker. Kyle is employed in competitive employment in the community. He makes above minimum wage. For four years after high school, he worked in a workshop and was paid sub-minimum wage. It wasn't a bad thing, but it was sub-minimum wage. The unemployment rate, and a lot of people may not know in this country for people with disabilities, is 8%, which is obscene in, in a time of low unemployment. Uh, those were 2018 figures. Uh, my question for you is, would you support uh, removing 14C certificates from the Fair Labor Standards Act that allow for places to pay sub-minimum wage? In fact, I haven't asked. There's a bill in the Senate right now, S-260, and they need co-signers. Would you commit to co-signing that bill? If, if the bill is to ex do exactly what you say, mm -hmm. which is to deal with that provision of 14C that allows sub-minimum wage, uh, then I commit to you to signing on to it because I've been looking at this issue for a long time. We should not have some minimum wage uh, for our beautiful children or beautiful people uh, who have special needs and, and disabilities. So you have that. Thank you very much. Thank you. And, and sir, I, I just want to tell you one other thing, if I can. One other thing, if I can, is um, we need to have education systems that, that are fully funded to deal with special needs education. And if I'm, your, if I'm your president, I commit 
The federal government is not fulfilling its requirements. It's putting tremendous pressure on schools. If I am your president, I will fully fund special needs education for our public schools. That is my fight, that's what we'll do. All right, in the middle, in the back, by the bar. Are you raising your hand to say, Booker, I got two for you? Two, two, oh, two, I thought two beers is what you were talking about. No, I, I don't drink, so that's all right, but go ahead. Okay, first question's about defense spending. How can we afford education? How can we afford infrastructure? How can we afford environmental programs, energy programs, transportation programs, anything, when we're spending $27,000 every second, every day? on war and war preparation. Are you committed to radically reducing our defense budget? That's my first question. The second question is our commitment to Israel and how we're giving the average Israeli family $23,000 a year while we're slaughtering Palestinians. We're demolishing 500 yeah. homes. This weekend, this weekend, we're demolishing 500 homes in Jerusalem and cutting down their forests. We're destroying their lives. and. It's a humanitarian crisis that we are participating in. It's blood on my hands as an American. What's your commitment to Israel and to creating justice for the Palestinians, for which we are a, a huge part of their demise? So two, two questions, let's deal with them separately. The first on the defense spending. We are spending unconscionable amount of money in foreign interventions that we should not be in in the first place. And this isn't just the trillions of dollars that were spent in Iraq. Most people in this room know that we're in foreign engagements we shouldn't be in. For example, we were refueling our military planes. We were refueling the Saudi planes that were then going and dropping American bombs on children in Yemen. Literally tens of thousands of children in Yemen were being killed, cholera outbreaks, famine, and we were spending taxpayer money doing it. Do you remember any president coming to Congress asking for the authorization of you for the use of military force for that, not at all. I'm going to stop those unnecessary military engagements that rack up tremendous debt. We're spending on our credit cards to do things that we shouldn't be doing in the first place. But more than that, our military, if you read the Inspector General reports, is a trail of financial horrors. We see a, a cor corrupt or broken systems that are allowing big, big contractors to abuse procurement imperfections uh, to make lots of money at the expense of proficiency, efficiency in our taxpayers. I commit to you to attacking that problem to create tremendous savings. And then the final thing is, I'm a guy that believes, like this president's former Secretary of Defense, that diplomacy, that, that foreign aid in, in, in crisis areas, he literally said, if you cut those things, then buy me more bullets because it creates more problems for the future. Yeah. I believe America's at its best when it stands with our allies. I believe where our best is when we lead with diplomacy, when we lead to help and not to hurt, and we do not have a reflexive use of military force that I believe is ultimately making us less safe, and it's definitely deepening our deficit and debt when we have critical priorities here at home. And then the final thing on, on the state of Israel, is I believe very strongly in the two-state solution. And I believe we are watching Israel do things right now that to me I don't agree with. I fundamentally don't agree with. And so I'm one of those folks that says time and time again, the settlement issue is a real crisis, but we cannot have a president that literally for the first time gives up on the idea of a two-state solution. Everything that I've been doing when it comes to the state of Israel is trying to preserve a pathway to give the right of Israelis to have their own nation, to be able to defend their borders, and to be able to have the right to exist. But I've been one of those senators who's also gone to the West Bank and, and, and met with Palestinian leaders. And we right now are pulling back humanitarian aid. We're pulling back the kind of things this president is doing to hurt ultimately what I think are basic human rights. And so I will always defend the right of Israel to protect itself. I will always defend the right of our critical ally in that region who is battling terrorists who have attacked and killed Americans, like Hezbollah, which has attacked and killed Americans, like Hamas, who's threatening Americans as well. But I'm not going to do that at the expense of the human rights and self-determination of the Palestinian people. I've stood up in the Senate and done that, and I'll do that again. Yes, sir. So this is, this is one of those questions where I hope with every presidential candidate you meet, you don't just ask, what are you going to do? Because people will tell you often what you want to hear. 
I want you to ask people what they've done already. Because even when I was a mayor, I understood that there was, was an existential crisis. It didn't just become an existential crisis recently when scientists were telling us we had 12 years. Scientists were telling us this two decades ago. And so when I was mayor of the city of Newark and I watched George Bush fail to join the Kyoto Accords, I joined with other mayors of major American cities and said enough. We actually, within our cities and the collective, produce the majority of the greenhouse gas problems. And we are gonna make, in my city, in collection with others, greening our cities and dealing with this climate change problem, not as a side priority, as a central priority. I announced to my city councilmen and others that we were gonna have a green lens on everything we do. And so we made sure that we were attacking our, our, our carbon footprint by environmentally retrofitting buildings. But you know what created multiple winds? It lowered the heat island that we're on. It actually made sure that we uh, uh, were helping to deal with our carbon footprint. It created jobs, union jobs for my city. It created apprenticeship programs for my kids. And on top of it, it saved taxpayers money. Even for reentry, what does prisoner reentry, uh, offender, re ex offender reentry have to do with it? Well, we said, let's get them green jobs. Yay! And so we literally got folks jobs greening our city, planting crops that are pulling uh, carbon out of the air. When I was the United States Senator, I led the fight to make sure that we had renewables that had long extended tax credits that incentivized investments, and I've been fighting to try to end the tax credits for oil companies and those people that are causing a lot of the problems. So my record is strong, but here's some more. If I am your president, I am going to make sure that first and foremost, we reverse the things that this president has done that's undermining our progress. That means fuel efficiency standards, the methane and mercury rule, the clean power plan, and more. I'm gonna make sure we double down on the technologies and innovations of the future to make sure that we lead the planet Earth to the green technologies that are gonna help us solve this problem. I'm gonna look at every department having ways from the Department of Transportation and accelerating our movement to electrification of transportation. I'm gonna look at the Ag Bill, hello Iowa, and make sure that we incentivize cover crops and our farmers doing the things that help with the problem. But we're not done yet, sir. It's also about looking at the rest of the world because we produce 15% of the problem. Now we punch them way above our rate, our weight, we're only 14 to 15%, well, excuse me, only four to 5% of the globe's population. But we can't solve this problem if we're doing everything. Uh, that are corrected within our own borders and not look to the rest of the planet Earth. So one of the first things I'm gonna do in the hours that I'm president is rejoin the Paris climate. Yeah. But that can't be it. As I said, everything has a green lens. So our foreign aid that, 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 that the person before you was talking about, our, our, which we give billions of dollars to countries on just about every continent there is. I'm gonna use our trade policy. I'm gonna use our diplomacy to do everything I can, leading by example, to pull the rest of the planet Earth to step up to this crisis, to make sure it's a central priority so we can save humanity and ensure that our children, our grandchildren, and our great-grandchildren have an incredible planet that's not no longer in crisis or peril. Okay? Yes, sir. question uh, is so right and it's a pain point for many of us. You got the man behind you so upset he was knocking over tables back here. <laughs> the, the very bargain of our, of our economy has, has, been, has been tilted away from working people. Let's just be very blunt about what's happened to the American economy. In my dad's generation, you work a full-time job, even if it's minimum wage, you're above the poverty line. Minimum wage hasn't kept up with, 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 with the poverty line. Now you work a full-time job, you're below the poverty line. One of my friends, Natasha Laurel, I wrote about her in my book, working at an IHOP, catching extra shifts, couldn't support her family, needed food stamps, needed housing subsidies just to get by. We must make this in America where someone who works a full-time job can provide for their family. And there's lots of ways that we can do that. And I'm gonna do that by things like my RISE credit, that if you're working in America, 
and you're a working family, that you are not going to see tax breaks going to the wealthiest Americans and going to roll back these toxic Trump tax credits, tax breaks to the corporations and the wealthiest. And I'm going to make sure that we give every American a massive increase in the earned income tax credit, but not just a maximum increase. We're going to do an increase so that 150 million Americans get a pay increase. That my plan alone would cut poverty in a third, but it would also redefine work. Because there's a lot of people that we all know in this room that are home working right now, taking care of a family member with Alzheimer's or special need kid, but they don't qualify for the earned income tax credit today because we don't value that work. Under my plan, we'll value that work. They too will qualify for the tax credit. There are young people, 18, 19, 20 years old, trying to work their way through college, and they don't get the earned income tax credit. They too should get a tax credit. If you're willing to work, you should qualify for our $4,000 back. But it's more than that if you're a senior citizen. You, you, you max out at a certain age, you can't collect the earned income tax credit. Well, how many seniors do we know that continue to work because their social security checks don't go far enough? They should qualify for that tax credit. We need to get dignity back to work, and that means in states like this and all across the country, we stop the attacks on labor unions. Yay! And we make sure that when I, do, when I do my massive infrastructure bill, one, two trillion dollars, we're gonna make sure that Davis-Bacon laws apply. We're going to make sure that project labor agreements apply. We're going to make sure that there are union jobs, buy American provisions, things that actually build out our economy. This is just common sense. That this should be a nation like our grandparents. Where in my father's generation, who was born to that greatest generation, 95% did better than their parents. Because we had a growing economy with shared prosperity. Now in this day and age, where corporations are ascending to power and 85% uh, uh, excuse me, they're, they're making an 85-year high in profits, and the corporations today are, are, are changing their culture. Literally, you have in, in, in this corporate consolidation that's going on where it's not even a fair capitalist system anymore. You have these, you look at what the American farmer's going through. Monsanto and other companies are, are, are eating up all those other small companies now. Two, three companies control all the source seeds and all the source chemicals. Then you have folks, these massive, a uh, 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 consolidation above, so farmers, instead of having three, four people to sell their goods to, now they've got one who's dictating price. And then you've got the ag industry being taken over by these large multinational corporations that are changing the way we do agriculture with these massive CAFOs that are poisoning our land and poisoning our rivers. This is every industry you're seeing this culture change. So not only am I going to be fighting to expand unions, fighting to raise the minimum wage, fighting to make sure working Americans get, uh, uh, get, get, get a, a tax credit, fighting to make sure that we have portable benefits and health care for all, fighting to make sure we have retirement security and we do things to rescue these Midwestern pension plans that are in trouble. But I'm also going to use my antitrust laws. I'm going to use my DOJ and the FTC to go after these massive corporate oligarchies that are undermining our democracy. It is these things and more that are going to lift wages in our country and create a nation of shared prosperity. Yeah. All right. I'm going to come right here. Hi. Um, so I moved here from Milwaukee, um, and now I'm a student athlete and in the pre loss. What's your sport? I play basketball. All right. Oh. All right. <laughs> um, <laughs> anyway, I'm a pre loss student at the Butte, and I play basketball for the No, nope, some more. There's some more. Anyway, my question is how important is my generation, or how do you get people from my generation to actually start caring about all the problems that you're talking about? Because a lot of questions. <laughs> so first of all, you, your being here is, is pretty amazing. The second thing is your generation is pretty extraordinary. I've watched after the aftermath of the Parkland shooting, your generation step up and say, I'm not gonna wait for older Americans. You guys haven't been solving this problem, we're gonna solve it. In, in my community, I see young people in high school leading walkouts. I see people in high school standing up and speaking to the issues of violence in our community. And so the one thing you don't need is somebody in their 40s or early 50s talking down to your generation and telling you what to do. Young people have been at the center of great movements for social change for generations. From the uprisings in Soweto, to the democracy movement in Tiananmen Square, to the, the battle in Birmingham against Bull Connor that I talked about before. So my challenge to you is not to look to me to tell you how to lead. 
is to lead. And for folks like you to get folks excited. Now I'll be there right with you. Some days I'll be challenging you to keep up with me and I hope some days you're challenging me to keep up with you. But what we really need right now is people to understand that you don't wait, need to wait to be 21, you don't need to wait to be 18, you don't wait, need to wait for somebody's permission to get something done. This nation needs you, it needs our young people, it needs our younger people who might be a little older than you, it needs our seniors and our kids, it needs everybody, all hands on deck. America is in crisis, but the Chinese symbol for crisis is danger and opportunity. Your generation can ensure that we avoid the danger and seize that opportunity. Thank you. Yes. What's your, what's your name? Glenn. Um, um, Glenn, you, you definitely go applaud Glenn if you like. Um, Glenn, we all come from traditions where people stand up and speak truth to power and speak truth uh, about our experience. It's the only way we can expand empathy and understanding. And so let's just lay it plain right now. Most of the issues I've been talking about often disproportionately will affect African American community. You know, we have incarceration, as you said, this is one of the worst states in America for racial disparities in incarceration, Iowa. We have a nation that has no difference between blacks and whites whatsoever for using drugs or even dealing drugs. But African Americans are almost four times more likely to be incarcerated. For. Our drug war, which has exploded our prison population since 1980, 500% has been fueled on the drug war. And a lot of people think that this doesn't go on, but I was so upset when the legislature, you know, when, when the, excuse me, when the governor didn't veto the, your medical marijuana bill because I'm watching what's happening and there were more marijuana arrests in 2017 than all violent crime arrests combined. Yeah. And again, if you're African American, you're four times more likely to be arrested for it. So you have people in your community, my state, who have criminal convictions for doing things that two of the last three presidents admitted to doing. And because of those racial disparities in incarceration for nonviolent drug offenses, we have come full circle in a sense that now there are more African Americans in the United States of America under criminal supervision, jail, prison, probation, parole, than all the slaves in 1850. And when you talk about gun violence, I've had people in Iowa stand up and tell me about the fear they have of their children going to school and doing drills that are reminiscent of what we decades and decades ago used to do for nuclear drills, duck and cover, now they're doing it for kids, scaring kids. Well, we know also that for African Americans, black men are 6% of the nation's population, but we make up well over 50% of the homicide victims. And so, uh, as America's fourth ever popularly elected African American in the Senate, just number four, I want you to know that I'm very conscious that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And a lot of the things I'm doing, like my baby bonds bill, which says whatever you are, if you're an American born as a child, you get an interest bearing account with $1,000 placed in it, and every year of your life you get up to $2,000 placed in, depending on the income of your family. And that means the lowest income kids or Iowans, by the time they get to be 18 years old, they will have up to $50,000 
to go to college with or to buy a home, do the things that create wealth. Because we have all these tax cuts that go to the wealthiest to create more wealth, but, but we don't have anything for the lowest income families. Every American, paychecks help you get behind, wealth helps you get ahead. Now this is, has a, uh, the other benefit of actually virtually eliminating the racial wealth gap in America. Because everybody will start with that equal thing. So, I want to end this question and take one more question, because that's why Tom moved up here, and we'll take it to the next person right here. So I, I want to just end this question one more time on gun violence. There was a time in American history that when, when people died, it would raise the consciousness of our country and we would change laws. When, when women were throwing themselves out windows in the shirtwaist factory fire, it, it raised the consciousness of our country to recognize what was going on in these sweatshops and we changed a whole slew of laws to protect Americans. Yeah. When, when four girls died in a bombing in a church in Birmingham, it, it, it rose up the consciousness of this country and we changed laws to take down segregation. But where are we now? They die in, in a club, slaughtered in a club in Orlando. We do nothing. They, they get slaughtered at a concert in Las Vegas, and we do nothing. They, they get killed in a synagogue in Pittsburgh, and we do nothing. The black church in South Carolina, they get killed, and we do nothing. In our schools, our children are slaughtered under their desks, and we do nothing. And on my block, Shahad, Hassan, I could go through the kids I know who've been killed on my streets, and we do nothing. That's not who we are. The corporate gun lobby cannot determine this debate anymore. If I'm your man, if I'm your president, we are going to change these laws. We are going to do something. We're going to protect our country. Last question. Last question. Now, I'm, not, I'm not running away. I told the people upstairs, I'll stick around. If you have questions directly for me, uh, I'll answer them. I'll take selfies. I'm not leaving right away. So we're going to answer this question, then I'll close. And then, by the way, before you ask the question, can I just say to you, thank you very much. <laughs> she, she, gentlemen, I love you. Because you all applauded, but they were doing, can you give me the sign language applause, please? <laughs> all right. And give her one of these, it's thank you in, in sign language if you can, thank you. Yeah, she's been amazing. Yeah. I haven't really given her that much rest. <laughs> no. <laughs> she's like, why do they send the people to New Jersey with me? I can't, my hands have to move very quickly to keep up with Jersey guys. All right, the last question. Yeah, I, I'm so happy you asked this question because I'm tired of hearing people say, oh, I was in Iowa and nobody asked me about the Mueller report. People don't care. No, people care in Iowa. So I really, really hope that people, it's, it's long, and I'm, I'm not a quick reader, it took me a long time to get through. Um, please, please read the Mueller report, because it, 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 it documents outrageous misconduct, lie after lie, deceit after deceit, a president ordering his court counsel to, White House counsel to manufacture evidence. And during his campaign, it's the, the, this behavior that literally says you have your foreign adversary comes to your campaign and says, hey, I've got some illegally obtained evidence, in, in essence. Do you want it? Do you want it? And they're like, oh, great. This is wonderful. Where can we meet? When even my Republican colleagues in the Senate say, no way, red flag, you call the FBI. And, and, and so Mueller put 10 examples down of, of what amounted to potential misconduct, that spoke to misconduct. And he put that in a report. It is the job of Congress now, which is supposed to be holding the executive accountable, to continue that investigation. And I think that we need to have, you know, Mueller before Congress. I think we need to have the unredacted report. I think that we should do all of these things. But now here's, here's the pickle. And as a vegan, I love vegetable puns. Um, <laughs> And, and I'm sorry, the one vegan in the room is like, woohoo! <laughs> vegan love! <laughs> um, 
this is the this is the challenge we have right now for our democracy is the, the, the House of Representatives started doing the right thing and starting to investigate these things and then the president stonewalled them I'm not giving you information I'm not giving you documentation I'm not giving you access to witnesses shutting it down that is completely violative of, of constitutional ideals one we have a balanced government where one branch is supposed to hold the other one accountable and so we are now literally in a very dramatic days ahead because the House of Representatives is taking a lot of this to court and we're going to see how that plays out. But I'm just one of these Americans, I've been one of these very sober, restrained people that said, hey, we should play this out and continue the investigation. But I'm telling you right now, a lot of us are, are, are getting to the point now where I think these coming days are going to be very telling. A lot of us are getting frustrated and so I'm just going to tell you where I stand right now. Everything is on the table legal action, going to the Supreme Court, or impeachment, all of it should remain on the table, and this president must comply with the kind of subpoenas and the kind of actions our Congress is taking to hold the executive accountable. If not, the very fabric, the very ideals of our Constitution are being undermined, and that in and of itself is unacceptable from any president, I don't care what party you're in, all right? Okay, so, two goals. Two goals I said I had. One is, I've got a lot of volunteers out there and a lot of people on my Iowa team. We've built up an extraordinary team of organizers that's getting bigger every, every day. I'm not joking, we're having lots of people sign up. I'm hoping that somebody will come out of here and come up to me, I'll give you a hug. And if you don't wanna have a hug, just you know, don't tell me you did it. But I hope some folks will sign a commitment to caucus card and join our mission, join our team. We've got 2020 elections, don't stand for the year, it stands for how many people are running, 2020. <laughs> <laughs> but no, nobody you're going to find with my unique resume that was both the chief executive of a state's largest city in the middle of a crisis that was known for decay and corruption that we turned it around. Nobody also has that combination of being a United States Senator that passed major pieces of bill working across the aisle. But, but, but also somebody that wants to stand up unapologetically and talk to the spirit of the aspirational spirit of where America has to go. I'm going to speak about that everywhere I go. That's my goal, so hope to get some of folks here, join me, maybe some folks here, sign up anyway, say I wanna learn more, I wanna sit down with some folks, but that's not my highest goal, I wanna return back to that. And that's where I wanna end with everybody. Because at the end of the day, it's not about one person. It's about us. And, and what I worry about, and I really worry about this, my dad used to tell me, boy, you drink deeply from wells of freedom and liberty that you did not dig. You eat lavishly from banquet tables prepared for you by your ancestors. Boy, don't sit around getting dumb, fat, and happy, consuming all your blessings. They should metabolize in your body so that you get out there and work, because you can't pay those blessings back, but you gotta pay it for them. And, and, and this challenge of my life is really, I know the family traditions of all of us. I don't care what your background is. All of us understand that every generation of Americans have to take the blessings of this nation that were earned by past generations and we have to earn them all over again or they'll be taken away from us easily. At the end of the day, the principles and the documents we were talking about in this last question as the great Learn Judge Learn Hand said, they're only as valuable, not because the paper they're written on, lots of countries have noble constitutions that have failed governments, our constitutional documents are only as good as long as those principles live in our hearts and are reflected in our actions. This is not, don't let this election be small, please. This is about my major goal. Don't let people tell you the best we can do and we gotta find a guy that can, or a woman that can beat Donald Trump. Please, we're bigger than that. That's the floor. That, that is fundamentally the floor, but it's not the height of our aspirations. Please, get someone who can beat Donald Trump, but let's get someone that can join with all of us taking responsibility for our country and charting a bolder, bigger destiny, and that's why I want to end with this. There is a place in Memphis, Tennessee called the Lorraine Motel, where Martin Luther King was slain to the gentleman's question. He showed up there for workers' rights. And, and at that spot where he was killed, for those of you who have not been there, if you look down, you will see a block of stone with words from scripture written on it. 
Now, I'm not up here to, to, to preach. To, I, I'm one of these guys, these guys, one of these Christians that would much rather hang out with a nice atheist than a mean Christian any day of the week. Um, God bless America. Uh, I'm the most soulful people I've met are folks who don't ascribe to religion. I'm one of these people who says, before you start telling me about your religion, first show it to me and how you treat other people. Yeah. And, and, but, but, but this is actually not about religion, even though I'm going to quote you words of scriptures. It's actually about a challenge to Americans. Why did they choose to put these words of scripture there where Martin Luther King was slain so that everyone would come after, the living would see a challenge to all of us? And what are the words? They're the words of Joseph's brothers... Joseph was the guy with the coat of many colors. Joseph was the guy that interpreted dreams, was favored by his father. His brothers were jealous. They're the words that Joseph's brothers uttered before they grabbed Joseph and they threw him into the pit to die. But he wouldn't die in the pit. He would rise on up and go lead a nation through crisis. He would lead Egypt through crisis. Now, we are a country that's in that pit right now. We're in that pit. You see it in Iowa because public education is under attack. We're in that pit right now because our inheritance of the best infrastructure on the planet Earth now has trillions of dollars of infrastructure debt. And kids in this state don't even have access to broadband in many communities. We're in that pit right now because there's a veteran who's come home, who's struggling, who's not here right now, who's struggling with mental illness, thinking about suicide, and they're struggling alone, not in a nation that is stepping up for them as we should. They're, if one American is in the pit for unjust reasons, we're all in the pit. And so what did they choose to write where Martin Luther King was slain as a message to all of us Americans who would have to carry on this nation? This is what it says where King was slain and my final challenge to everyone here. It says the words of Joseph's brothers, Behold, here cometh the dreamer. Let us slay him and see what becomes of the dream. What will become of our dream? The dream of America. The dream on this Memorial Day that we recognize that Americans from the beaches of Normandy to, to Iwo Jima that Americans died for, what will become of our dream? That black and white, Christians, Jewish, all Americans like Goodman, Cheney, and Schwarner were willing to give their lives for like in Mississippi when it was burning. What will become of our dream? Will it become diluted? Will it become diminished? Will it become divided against itself? What will become of the dream? And I tell you, we all have to answer that question. We in our generation, like generations past, have to say, I too dream America. I will take responsibility for the dream. I'm not going to wait for someone else. I will stand and make sure the dream stays alive, make sure the dream lives, that I will stand up and reclaim the dream, and dream anew, and make it a bold dream, a daring dream. In the face of opposition, I will make it a defiant dream once again. And I'm here to tell you right now, in this moral moment, that's what America needs. Not small thinkers, not people looking at this election about just one person in one office. Now it is time for big dreams and bold actions. And if we dream like that, and stand like that, and love like that, then we will not remain 